cities. As you might recall, those were mostly communist years in this part of the world. Against this backdrop, at 16, I discovered the writings of Ayn Rand, which first drew my attention to the capitalism versus socialism versus communism distinction. In Ayn Rand, I found a very important concept that resonated with me, excellence. A pursuit for excellence in whatever domain you choose to pursue, coupled with strong work ethic and a commitment to creating value, for me, epitomized capitalism. Built into this basic assumption is that you get compensated for creating value. Producers produce, consumers consume by paying the producers for the value they create. It made perfect sense to me. Corollary to the theorem of excellence is if you're not brilliant, you're either mediocre, in which case you live a middle class life, and if you're lazy, uneducated, etc., you live a life of poverty. The exception to this rule is if you win the birth lottery and inherit an upper class lifestyle, or you can marry into an upper class lifestyle, but by and large, your merit and work ethic determines the outcome. Maybe a somewhat simplistic representation, but at, at its core, the capitalistic system is designed to produce inequality by rewarding achievement. You may ask, is this a fair system? This question at a philosophical level needs to make a fundamental distinction in the definition of fairness. What do you believe in? You produce, therefore you deserve, or you exist, therefore you deserve. If you believe the former, then capitalism is a very fair system. If you believe the latter, then capitalism is a blatantly unfair system that can only be set right by wealth redistribution so everyone can have a good life. At least in my early youth, I held an unambiguous view that fairness equates to the you produce therefore you deserve theory. I'm a technologist, an entrepreneur. I have to earn my keep, and I like the accountability of that path. I live in America, the temple of capitalism. In fact, I live and work in Silicon Valley, the seat of the modern renaissance. For a very long time, America worshiped free market capitalism as the only path to follow. After World War II, the country experienced tremendous growth and a large, comfortable middle class thrived for over 50 years. And then, two tectonic shifts happened. The internet took over the world. And globalization became a large scale phenomenon as a result. Manufacturing jobs moved to China. IT and BPO services jobs moved to India. American middle class got hollowed out. China and India grew at a fast pace. Tremendous poverty reduction took place. Free market capitalism allowed the entire world to join in the capitalism bonanza. America and Western Europe lost. Asia won. It turned out to be a zero-sum game. Today, governments are questioning whether free market capitalism is still the best path forward. If you are following the American election, Donald Trump has been running on an anti-immigration, anti-globalization platform. The Republican Party in America has always been a champion of free market capitalism. And they are horrified at this protectionist turn of events, but the fact that Trump got the party's nomination tells us there's a lot of bad feeling against immigration and globalization. In recent years, we've seen the rise of speculative capitalism as a much more powerful force than the brand of capitalism 
that I got seduced by. The 2008 financial crisis exposed the flaws in the global financial system and especially the level of corruption driving Wall Street's fortunes. What does Wall Street do? What do speculative investors do? They speculate. They trade. Real estate investors do that too. They buy low and try to sell high. Except, leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, worthless real estate, subprime mortgages, were being peddled by banks to their customers, sugar-coated as credit default swaps, a fancy name for garbage wrapped with fancy paper and a ribbon. Something in the temple of capitalism started stinking. At this point, I want to draw a distinction between two types of capitalism. Real capitalism, where value gets created and producers get rewarded, mostly deal in what we call in economics real goods. Then there is the domain of financial goods. Some of it, especially investments that help entrepreneurs create value through debt or equity financing, can be of great value. But a large portion of the finance industry just moves money from here to there. They don't create a lot of value. They create, however, a lot of wealth. And a lot of it through a corrupt speculative system, a bit like a casino, gambling. Not so good. Corruption took speculative investing to extremes and crashed the market in 2008 and nearly destroyed the global financial system. Governments bailed out too big to fail banks, privatized profits and socialized losses became a matter of great dissatisfaction among taxpayers in countries that had to bail their banks out. People started asking the question, does capitalism still work? Or is the system now rigged beyond recognition? Excellence without integrity doesn't yield a fair system. There was plenty of intellectual horsepower in Wall Street. People who could have been great physicists or computer scientists and create, created real value instead became traders on Wall Street. But there was so much money to be made. They sold their souls and dedicated their brilliant minds to milking a corrupt system. This is the point in 2008 when I, too, started questioning capitalism. At that time, I used to write a weekly column for Forbes. I wrote a piece called Capitalism's Fundamental Flaw that remained on the homepage of Forbes.com as the most read article for a month. I analyzed the current crisis of capitalism as a speculator versus value creator debate, not a rich versus poor debate. I prescribed that we need to go back to a capitalism that focuses on value creation. Entrepreneurship that creates value, solves problems, addresses challenges. Take the example of Bill Gates. No one begrudges his fortune because he has served humanity by putting the personal computer literally in every home. And it has immeasurably improved the lives of billions of people. No one begrudges the fortune of Steve Jobs. He has put a supercomputer in every hand through the smartphone revolution. Again, immeasurably improved the lives of billions of people. No one begrudges the value creator's fortune because they have earned their wealth. But people resent fortunes amassed through rigged systems, corrupt processes, and dishonest means. Today, one of the greatest challenges that capitalism is facing is that speculative capitalism has become a dominant force. This dominance needs to be controlled, especially the corruption needs to be controlled through regulation. 
I would like to focus next on entrepreneurial capitalism, where at least to some degree the correlation between value creation and wealth creation isn't quite broken. Finance in this corner of the universe actually does serve as a tool for creating value. Venture capital is the direct instrument that we use along with some other financial tools to build companies that address customer needs. Venture capital is a great tool. However, it has limitations. I spent many years in the venture capital driven entrepreneurship world. I've done venture funded startups as founder and CEO and I've raised a lot of money for my companies. But the venture capital model is very particular. It fits businesses that are going to grow at a hyper fast rate and that also address very, very large market opportunities with total available market sizes of multiple billions of dollars. The universe of companies that fit these requirements is minuscule, but they get all the attention. If you read the popular entrepreneurship media, everybody assumes that entrepreneurship equals financing. I grew up in this world and I kind of drank the Kool-Aid for a while, but I'm someone who's curious with out-of-the-box questioning tendencies, so I asked myself, what the hell is going on here? Well, over 99% of the businesses that come to look for financing actually get rejected. They get rejected for a very good reason. They don't fit this ultra-high growth, hyper-large market size framework that drives venture capital financing. But many of these companies are perfectly viable businesses. The message entrepreneurs are getting is that if they cannot raise financing, they cannot build businesses. That is a completely wrong message. Many of the businesses rejected by venture capital are going to be perfectly fine 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million businesses built over 10, 15, 20 years. And these businesses need to be built. The problems that these businesses would solve need to be solved. I started asking, why have we created this myth that entrepreneurship equals financing, when in reality, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits? This is the philosophical underpinning of One Million by One Million, the global virtual accelerator I have started. To put things in context for you, on the one side of the entrepreneurial universe are ventures like Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, that have become multi-billion dollar enterprises. On the other side of the spectrum is Adi Dhakeshwari Bostraloi, a sari store that has been around for generations. But it's not a billion dollar enterprise. Venture capitalists won't fund a sari store that goes to save 10 crores in annual return, annual turnover after five years. But in the economic pyramid, it is critical to have such businesses flourish. And for this purpose, the notion of bootstrapping is super critical. Bootstrapping is building businesses largely without external financing. My analysis is that such businesses are absolutely critical in the next phase of capitalism to mitigate the economic inequality that has been created in the world today. Today's entrepreneurial capitalism is driven by venture capital, which has an inherent tendency to create very large fortunes, but very few of them. How many Googles have you heard of? How many Facebooks? And thus, fortune accumulates in the hands of a few, very few people. In 2014, the top 1% of America's wealthy owned 40% of the nation's wealth. Fortune has been steadily accumulating at the tip of the economic pyramid. My observation, however, is that in Silicon Valley, we have learned a lot about how to build successful businesses following the principles of capitalism. If this knowledge can be broadly disseminated, and a much larger number of entrepreneurs start building successful businesses, doesn't have to be billion dollar businesses, can be two crore businesses, 
That would drive fortune in the middle of the economic pyramid. And that is both possible today and necessary today, given everything else that is going wrong in the global economic system. My vision for capitalism in its next phase is a distributed, democratic capitalism whereby millions and millions of entrepreneurs build small and medium businesses that are profitable and sustainable in the long run. In other words, we need to create fortune in the middle of the pyramid. So how is this possible to accomplish? The answer to this question is not finance, it is education. In fact, again, the in entrepreneurship ecosystem is misreading the challenge and running after financing as the solution. I don't believe that. I believe entrepreneurship education is of paramount importance, and that is what will drive broad adoption of a capitalistic system of value creation as well as wealth creation, although more modest than the billionaire fortunes. No, we will not create a million billionaires. And that kind of excess is not necessary. Just to give you an example, the morning after the Brexit vote, as Europe watched in horror, I spoke with a Greek entrepreneur who runs a $5 million company called Marine Traffic. People are leaving Europe in droves right now. Europe is a fine example of the kind of disaster that socialism creates. And yet, here, Dimitris Mamos had created a successful business from Athens that speaks to my vision, democratic distributed capitalism. As of July 2016, youth unemployment rate in Greece stands at 50.3%. Spain is at 43.9%. Italy is at 39.2%. France is at 24.4%. It's a dreadful, tragic story of several lost generations. If Europe could mint a million entrepreneurs like Dimitris, the continent could be saved. I have another example from Kolkata. Pallav Nadani runs a company called Fusion Charts. It's not a billion dollar company. But it is a technology company that every year does over $10 million in revenue. Up to $7 million in revenue, this company operated 100% from Kolkata. But with a global clientele. Now they have a Bangalore operation as well. What if we had 100 of these right here in Kolkata? What would that do to the economy here? What if we had 1,000? This is my work today. In 2010, I founded One Million by One Million, 1M by 1M for short, the first global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP, and 10 million jobs. We run this out of Silicon Valley, but work with entrepreneurs all over the world. The program is first and foremost an online educational program where you get to learn the nuances of technology entrepreneurship from over 700 successful entrepreneurs. We also do active mentoring and make introductions to potential customers, channel partners, investors, media analysts, etc. One of the companies from the program, Freshdesk, has raised over $100 million in venture capital and has some 40,000 customers around the world. The company was born in Chennai, but has moved headquarter to San Francisco recently. I'm very proud of Freshdesk. I am, however, equally proud of a different type of entrepreneur that I have encountered through our work. You see, we do these free online mentoring sessions every week. One day, a first-year college student from Shiliguri came to the mentoring roundtable and pitched an idea that he was working on. He wanted to use Uber-style GPS-enabled technology to power a small business delivery network in his regional market. I found it fascinating that this boy 
had come up with a decent concept, found 1M1M, and was pitching this to me half a world away. And this happens every week. We work with entrepreneurs from all corners of the world, not just India, Africa, Asia, Latin America, everywhere. And of course, US and Europe continue to be big markets for our work. So I do believe entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial capitalism can be democratized, and wealth can be created in the middle of the pyramid using capitalistic principles. In the next two to three decades, the potential for distributed capitalism is very high, and the outcome should be extremely positive around the world. In the next segment of my presentation today, however, I need to also alert you to what is happening beyond that time frame. In the 30 to 50 year time frame and beyond, technology and automation will create tremendous disruption. 60 to 80% of all jobs will likely get automated. Now that is a scary situation. I'm sure you're thinking, oh, I've heard this before, machines replacing jobs, new jobs always emerge. Yes, in the Industrial Revolution, for instance, this was a major concern. But we have seen tremendous job growth since then. This technology revolution is, however, different. Before, machines could not think. Now they can. And because of the processing power available in tiny chips, they can think incredibly fast, process unbelievable amounts of data in a nanosecond. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics are moving forward at breakneck pace right now. The march of automation looks pretty much unstoppable. Let me give you an example. China managed to do tremendous poverty reduction on the back of manufacturing over the last couple of decades. But no longer can industries employ huge masses of people and drag populations out of poverty. Foxconn, one of the largest manufacturing companies in China that makes iPhones for Apple, this May eliminated 60,000 people out of their 150,000 workforce. These people were replaced by robots. We can safely assume that India's poverty reduction strategy cannot be manufacturing, because new factories would inevitably use robotics, not people. Agriculture is seeing very similar levels of automation as well, by the way. I'll give you another example, this time software, not hardware. In the advertising industry, media buying and allocating budget to various types of advertisements and various media outlets has been a crucial job. Today, advertising is shifting online rapidly, and media buying in the context of online advertising is a 100% automated job that is performed by software, not human beings. It's all done with mathematical precision, measured in real time, and human beings just cannot play in this rapid fire software application game. Same thing happens in finance, by the way, with real time high frequency trading where human beings simply play no role. Machines think, machines look at data, machines make decisions in split seconds. Let's talk about the field of medicine. If you think about what a doctor needs to do, to diagnose an illness, she needs to consider all the symptoms, take into account all the test results, consider all the treatment options, factor in all the side effects of various medications and their interplay with other medications the patient is already taking. This is effectively a multivariate optimization problem that a doctor has to do in her head. And she needs to keep up with all the new research and advances in medical science and factor those in as well. The field of medicine is full of inc incorrect diagnosis and mistreatment of illnesses. Now, if you replace this whole process with software, which IBM is trying to do with their Watson supercomputer, medical diagnosis, 
becomes a truly scientific deterministic process. I can tell you, if I have the option of being diagnosed by software versus a human doctor, I would always prefer software. It will be far more accurate. In the medical field, there are also tremendous advances in robotic surgery. So the medical field will get dramatically disrupted in the next 30 years. The legal profession will face similar disruption with lawyers getting replaced by software. There are, of course, both pros and cons in this disruption. If the medical profession can be automated to that extent, billions of people can have access to quality medical care. Today, this number is relatively low. That would be a huge positive outcome of automation in the medical field, for example. In another industry, transportation, there's already huge disruption underway. Some of you are already using services like Uber and Ola. These are replacements for taxis. Well, the taxi industry is a major employer, and this trend is going to destroy enormous numbers of jobs. And this one isn't even a few decades away. It's here, now. It's upon us. Then we have self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles that drive themselves, including trucks. This technology is almost ready. If governments allow autonomous vehicles, this will eliminate the requirement for drivers. If you have a combination of ride sharing a la Uber and autonomous cars, Pricewaterhouse predicts that 99% of the vehicles on the roads can be removed altogether. The total size of the fleet will fall from 245 million vehicles to just 2.4 million vehicles. I'm going to repeat. The total size of the fleet will fall from 245 million vehicles to just 2.4 million vehicles. Car ownership drops. This eliminates entire professions like truck drivers, taxi drivers, shrinks the car manufacturing industry dramatically, car insurance industry gets decimated, car service industry shrinks, massive di disruption. 10 million jobs will disappear. Of course, sitting in Kolkata, you are thinking, boy, it would be so much better if fewer cars were on the roads. Maybe India can leapfrog to ride sharing on self-driving cars and no car ownership. Huge improvement in quality of life. Pollution goes down, we can breathe. Congestion goes down. That's right, that's the positive outcome of this disruption. One thing that we should consider in this context is the role of government policy. There are certain aspects of this disruption where government cannot play any role. For instance, whether a factory uses massive automation or not is their business, not the government's. The government cannot stop a manufacturing plant from automating its operations, but the government can choose not to authorize self-driving cars and trucks. So the government can choose to slow down the march of technology, especially one that is likely to impact 10 million jobs, as the autonomous vehicles innovation would do. At MIT, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee have, done, have been modeling these changes and have published a huge body of work. If what I'm talking about is something you want to investigate further, please look at their findings. So to net this disruption out, in about 30 to 50 years, 60 to 80% of all jobs will be automated. Even software can be developed by code generators. What won't get automated? Scientific research will survive. Creation of art, of music, of films, of culture will survive. Playing professional sports will survive. But the vast majority of people will have nothing to do professionally. And this has already started. In 1990, the top three car makers in Detroit had a market capitalization of $36 billion and 1.2 million employees. In 2014, the top three firms in Silicon Valley, with a market capitalization of over 
one trillion dollars had only 137,000 employees. Let me repeat, $36 billion market cap in Detroit in 1990, 1 1.2 million employees versus 2014, over $1 trillion of market cap and just 137,000 employees. So what does society look like in an all play and no work world? You see, work is an essential block of the human existence today. Work offers identity, structure, meaning. If you take work out, human beings will have to figure out what their identity is all about. If they don't have to go to work for significant chunks of the day, they need to find alternative means of creating structure. These are not easy things to come up with on the fly. In a post-work world, there is the danger of people with nothing to do becoming zombies who watch television all day long or play computer games. An idle brain is a devil's warehouse, as the saying goes. I find the idea of a society comprising mainly of idle people extremely scary. Now, this is also a scenario in which capitalism fails. Most people don't earn any money anymore and have to be put on some sort of welfare. Inequality grows to extreme levels. Only a very small percentage of people make huge fortunes. There's a small affluent class. The rest has no jobs and hence no means of subsistence. Welfare in that scenario needs to grow tremendously. People are already talking about universal basic incomes. That's an option. People are paid a small amount of basic income to cover all their basic expenses. It's very expensive to implement if seven to nine billion people need to be supported on such programs. But say we can figure out a way to afford universal basic income. At that point, society looks very close to a communist dream. Everyone has a basic income. Food, clothing, shelter needs are met. The basic needs on Maslow's hierarchy are well addressed. Yes, there is tremendous inequality with the concentration of wealth at the tip of the pyramid, but the bulk of society operates in a communist model with the lowest common denominator level of lifestyle. Except it's an utterly discouraging and uninspiring mass mediocrity scenario. There are, needless to say, two schools of thought. An utopic one in which society becomes so rich that people's basic needs are all met and people have infinite leisure to pursue art, music, scientific research, sports, hobbies, friendships, spiritual contemplation. A dystopic one in which people become zombies Eight to 12 hours a day of television watching instead of going to work, long unproductive days, identity crises, social unrest, crime. And by the way, people are quite poor. Basic needs are met, but no one has any money to buy anything discretionary. So people don't have any incentive to produce anything of value either, except the basics. Or some luxury products for the super rich, which no one else can afford. The super rich go on vacation to Mars on Elon Musk's spaceship. Humanity otherwise lives an uninspiring existence. All this is not that far away. 30 to 50 years. Capitalism will come under tremendous duress, if not an existential threat. We will go back to a fortune at the tip of the pyramid society, and that tip will be incredibly small. A few thousand people will control all the wealth in the world. Capital will drive wealth, not labor. There is no reason to work, hence there is no incentive to work. People who own the machines will make the money. And that's one of the key issues driving the concerns over the future of artificial intelligence. French economist Thomas Piketty has written extensively on the subject of inequality and concentration of wealth in recent years. 
His book, Capital in the 21st Century, calls for massive wealth redistribution through taxation. I can't say I'm necessarily comfortable with his ideas, his solutions, but he is certainly pointing to the right problems. This level of inequality, without some well thought through strategy for social reengineering, will lead to revolution and anarchy. Karl Marx, of course, predicted that capitalism will eventually destroy itself, giving way to socialism. In the last hundred years, the opposite has happened. Capitalism has emerged victorious, communism fails, and the socialist countries aren't looking so bright and shiny. But in 50 years, if capitalism does indeed destroy itself, then perhaps Marx would be proven right. I don't know. I'm neither a communist nor a socialist. I happen to be a capitalist. So all this makes me rather queasy. Nonetheless, I cannot help but acknowledge that capitalism will, in the not too distant future, hit the wall. And then what? I don't have answers. I urge you to think about what a post-capitalism society might look like, what a post-work society might look like. I don't know if this transition will happen in my lifetime, but it will definitely happen in the lifetimes of those who are 20 years younger. And it will happen within the next 30 to 50 years. Perhaps we come to a point where karma yoga becomes less dominant, becomes a less dominant guiding principle for humanity to live by. Perhaps bhakti yoga, gyan yoga, Raj Yoga takes a more central place in our way of life. But it will require a drastic reorientation in how society is organized when capitalism is dead. And by all indication, I think it is safe to say that in 50 years, capitalism will be dead.